Okay, people, are we recording? I think we are. I think I'm too close, though. I think I'm good. Okay. This week, I read The Men Who Lost America. I'm like, the title got me, right? The title got me real quick. It's one of these on Audible, on the Audible Plus account. So it's an Audible book. Um, yeah, just the title. I was like, I've never read a history of the revolution, the American Revolution, from the British sort of side. And apparently, the British people haven't either, because there's not a lot of them. At least according to the author. But why would he lie about that? Okay, so, that's why I got it. Would it have been better, I think, with maps? I don't, I think it would have. I think it would have been better with maps. But, you know, that's a trade-off you get with Audible versus a printed book. And I'm not even sure the printed book would have maps in it, so I can't say... I can't say that's a, a major downside. Uh, my rating. This one is a 3 out of 5. It's good, solid history. It's not done in any kind of a way to draw someone out of their genre. It's not for... I wouldn't say for casuals, honestly. We get a little into the weeds, some some political intrigue, these kind of things. Y you need to be interested in the sugar trade of the Caribbeans in the Revolutionary Times, sort of. You know what I mean? This kind of thing. If that doesn't interest you, you're not going to be drawn out by this book. And there's no there's no magical sort of language used to draw sort of the hardcore readers it's just a solid history hold on I got something in my eyeball I think I got it I think I got it it's just a solid history it's a 3 out of 5 what he does uh, O'Shaughnessy I think that's his name what our author does is he we, we start with a big chunk, right? Overview. Pop, 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 pop. Then we hit each character. Uh, what, who do we got? George the Third, Lord North, General and Admiral Howe, um, John Burgoyne. All right, these kind of names. These are the big British names at the time. And he'll start with, let's say, the king. And run through the events, essentially. Not He's not taking every little point. Sort of a wide swath of events. From the king's perspective. What he sort of would have thought. How he reacted to it. Maybe his, his whys. And then sort of a rundown of what happened afterwards. And then he'll grab the next guy. So, you have a lot of ground repeated. Because it's the same events, but then different people. Which, I, at first, I thought I might not like, but it ends up working really well. Because, you know, like in a TV show, when when they're like going to have one of those episodes, the time travel episodes, and things keep happening? Well, at some point, you stop seeing the things and start noticing the differences. This is sort of what we get here. Where the overview, and then when we get down to like a certain general, you have the idea of the overview in your mind. And then it pieces together really well in your head. Earl of Sandwich. <laughs> That's one of the guys, actually. All right, we, so we start with George the Third. Now, of course, we all know America wanted, you know, representation in their taxation. No taxation without representation. And it's like, why didn't the British just give it to him? And the king, now the king wasn't against any individual issue any of the colonists had. Remember, they were all sort of British. They were all British. So they're all his subjects. But the way he sees it, it doesn't matter if you're in America, if you're in India, 
or you're, if you're in Liverpool, right? You all are my subjects and you have to listen to what I say. So he took it as um, the strength of the king and not just for his sake, right? So he's king no matter what. They're not like, I want to overthrow the king. It's not that serious. But if the king has always been able to dictate where the army goes, let's say, and he does something that makes it so that there's other uh, some other person that does, then future kings have lost that um, power, so to say. And in his mind, that would then have weakened the king. He doesn't want it weakened for future generations. So he can't, he doesn't in his mind want to just give in. But he, he's not against any of their causes in, in particular, which is sort of funny. Right? It wasn't a real... British heart's not in this fight. That's what you sort of notice from, from the whole thing. It's these outside things. They're these outside causes that make them want to not give in. Uh, then we get to a Lord North. So you have your king, and he's like the prime minister. He's running sort of the government... Of course, talking to the king a lot, this kind of thing. He's a big to-do. He, I think he's the more, okay, in politics, if I make a move and then it doesn't work, my enemies see that as weakness and then will then attack. Right? So when he makes a move, he doesn't want it to fail. He wanted to somehow kowtow the Americans. He didn't think, and this was sort of pervasive, a pervasive thought. No one really thought they had it in them. So, his style was to, let's say, threaten. Well, threats only work if they don't call your bluff. They sort of called his bluff. So when he would do, like, he did the T-Act. Now, even the East India Trading Company didn't want the Tea Act. They're like, they're not going to take it well. Can we just not do it? Right? Other politicians didn't want it. It wouldn't have even made tea more expensive for America. It, it would have made the tea cheaper. But on principle, it's like, okay, I'm going to give you your chips, but you got to kiss this ring first. Meaning, you know, I'm better than you. <laughs> That's what the Americans didn't want. That's what really offended. So, he he pushed this tea act. And then they did the Boston Tea Party, right? Which everyone was really offended by. I didn't think they took it that serious. But apparently the British public even was really, like, not about that. They didn't like it. I thought it was a great idea. So, once they did that, he, of course, has to amplify because if his tea act idea was bad, then his next acts might be bad as well. And then they try and oust him out of office. And he didn't want that. So his next acts are, what are, what are they called? Uh, the coercive acts is what they call them. And it's he, he wants to put even more pressure. And of course you can say that, you know, that didn't help. It kind of made the valve bust. Once he was in, though, I don't think he saw, Lord North saw a way to sort of get out without his enemies thinking he's weak. That was his main crux. Um, he, he tried to do, I think, what's it called? A concili conciliatory proposal. Right? And sort of the root of it is, all right, we'll sort of leave you be, but you got to pay us some money, right? Like a due. And Thomas Jefferson was, was really adamant that this missed the point. To him, the point was, what good is it for us to send you money if you know nothing about Philadelphia, right? You're on the other side of the ocean. Philadelphia has such and such issue. 
that w our money should help us fix us, right? That was sort of his his thinking. He didn't see how you could administer that way. And you wonder, you wonder how, I'm um, like, how history would have gone had they just allowed that. You, you know what I mean? Because in a lot of instances, and this is partially why sort of the, the ball picked up steam. In Britain, they all had this belief that, right, because they're British colonists, that they still are loyal to the king. This wasn't that far off. A good chunk of America was still loyal to the king. They wouldn't have wanted to revolt. Right now, how this manifests is different than what they thought. They thought, if you start a war, if I show up, all these people are going to flood to me. This didn't happen, right? For various reasons. Their displacement was odd, right? So if they were evenly displaced, it might have helped. If they were centrally, right? Like if they all lived in cities, that would have helped. But they were sort of hodgepodge, intermixed weird. And, of course, the revolutionists have the home field advantage. So his thinking isn't too wrong to say if I squeeze a little, the politics on their side of the water might adjust. I think where he was wrong in is in thinking they had no statesman, right? And underrating a Thomas Jefferson, a Ben Franklin, and the effects that these people had on the people around them, right? I think that's the real root of their problem. Um... There's also a lot of politics he talks about in Britain itself. So a big thing in that time, <laughs> which is funny, were, were these pamphleteers. These people would make a little pamphlet, like the kind you would get, you know, to tell you about this great convention. You know, this meeting of the clockwork people of East Texas, right? And they make a little foldable pamphlet, right? Well, these sort of pamphlet type ideas... People would, would, smart people, smart people would write very smart things in these pamphlets and just disperse them out in amongst the people. And it would sway public opinion, more so almost than a newspaper. I don't think, I don't know why. I don't know if the newspapers had columnists at this time or if those columnists weren't believed or how this came across. But for some reason, these pamphlets in people's hands had a major effect. And even in Britain, right, because I know it happened a lot in the revolution in America. A lot of pamphleteering, getting the word out, galvanizing, right, where instead of you feeling like you live out in the woods, but at least you're a British citizen, you can feel this closer connection to some American somewhere, right? So, But there are pamphleteers in Britain as well. There's one called the Constitution Society. They were big on, their, they'd raise money selling these and try and help the revolution in some way or be against it from their from their side of the water, right? They didn't like the killing that was going on. You know, these are British citizens, essentially, you're killing. It, it, it was very unpleasant. So there was more of a to-do politically on the British side than I ever thought. For whatever reason, I just assumed the British were as unified as we were and we just whooped them, right? Sort of not the case. Um, now we get to sort of your Admiral and General Howes. They're brothers, right? He sort of intermixes these a kind of a lot in a, in a kind of a way. But they go, um, they, send the big, they send a big fleet. They send a big fleet. We've got to invade America and quell this rebellion. Um... This is another point. It's an interesting point, even on, because once you start an action, right, then all the trailings come with that action. I think at that time, you could have upwards of, I want to say 12%, 12% of your supply needs, food, clothing, you know, all of this stuff is following the army. That's wives and girlfriends and kids. 
These are extra things attached. I guess aides or whatever. Helpers. These are extra things attached to an army that that, that, that much of your supply is eaten up by. A major, major issue. But add to it, at this time now, British isn't just Britain, right? It's the, the key point here is that it's an empire. So, taking troops and boats to America means you don't have troops and boats to defend Britain against the French or the Spanish. You don't have you don't have defenses to keep Ireland supplanted. You have to maybe remove defenses from the Caribbeans, from Menorca, Gibraltar, India. Right? It stretches all these places. All these places need boats. There's only so many. There's only so many troops. And when I was reading that, I got me thinking of back in the day, right? Your Cyrus the Greats. When he took over a town, an Athens or whatever, you know, Damascus or whatever he took over, Babylon. Did he take Babylon? I think he got Babylon. In any case, he would take a town and the first thing he'd want is troops from that town. Like the, That's the main thing you got to promise me is troops. And of course you go away from that because outside troops are harder to be loyal, etc., etc. But with that thinking, I wonder, now Britain had the strongest army and the biggest navy, but yes, India is making you money, but what good is the money at this point, right? You can't buy America off, but if from when you landed in India, if you had been training the locals, right? And I'm not, you don't have to just leave them there, pull them out of India, get because India has a ton of people. They can afford to lose some. So you get 40000 out of India. It's a big expense. And you bring them to Britain or Gibraltar or some other place and train them like, a, like an army. The British way. Now maybe you don't, you, you'll get some translators. You need officers that speak the language. All the other hurdles that come with it. But the essential part is you have now people out of Britain. I mean out of India troops and then I would then dispense those troops to all of my places right so you come in you're poor Britain's taking you over and now they're making your life better by giving you money you'll be rich when you come out of this you could have grown because even from then to like even to World War two one and two even till now in a lot of ways the, the Canadians are still happy being part of the Commonwealth, I believe it. Australia certainly is, right? They're still happy to be a part of this entity. So you could have built on that, right? You could have said, we're this thing. Yes, you'll, you'll have to go to war, but we also then give you all these benefits. You start bringing the benefits, and then they sort of overlook it. But now you instill a culture of service of military service from these people in India because that's your mate that's one of their major issues is just not enough so if your admiral Howe, obviously if he'd have had more boats he'd have been happy but even not more boats if he just had more troops don't think they lose this war and you would have maintained all of your holdings in the other places maybe expanded them right I don't know. In any case, they get to New York. They take, they essentially win everywhere. They take New York City. And as they take it, the revolutionaries leave, the loyalists come in, which amplifies sort of the Admiral's problems because he's got to feed these people. And then his, uh, the general, General Howe, his problem is sort of the same. Without enough boats, I don't get enough supplies. Well, they're thinking back in those days is I send an army, you find food when you're there. It's not a big deal. There's plenty of woods. There's plenty of deer. Well, I got guns, right? Shoot some deer, eat. Well, that works until <laughs> until the revolutionaries are shooting you. At some point, they were losing more troops foraging to the revolutionaries 
than they were to any actual standing battles. It's the kind of attrition that was happening out in these out in these woods of New York. Which, if you, if you get some, I'm gonna get some pictures of. In my mind, it's always New York as New York City, but New York State is fairly large. So is New Jersey. And they got a lot of woods, right? So I can imagine having to go up in those woods and getting shot at constantly. We are not having fun. Oh. See, but they thought, again, he went in, he went in, and fairly quickly he realized, I don't have enough troops. It, okay, every town I take needs more troops to hold that town. You can't just take it and walk away, they'll come back in. So, I'm ta I, they won every every fight, right? I took New York, I took Boston, I took Philadelphia. But each one needs more people, and then that's less people for the next fight. And their foods, they turn around and eat. And my food's in England, and it got to come by boat, and I don't have enough boats. A lot of time, a lot of times, like what even hurt shipping, right? I would send a boat full of food, and instead of sending it back so I can fill it up and send more food. They would keep it, right, in the Caribbean. Like, hey, that's a boat I can use. I'm keeping that crap. Put some guns on it. Excellent. Some of them would keep them just to be warehouses, right? So I would go to a, a, a Jersey, and I don't have places to put my food or gunpowder or ropes or cannons or whatever else the army needs. So I'm leaving it on the boat. No, no, the boat can't go back to England. It's got to stay there with all that stuff. I got nowhere else to put the stuff. I ain't putting it on the dock. It'll get rained on. Then what goes the powder? Right? So these, all these kind of issues kept building. And you pair that with Lord North's political issues where he can't sort of show failure. And you start to see this sort of chain reaction happening. Uh, we get a Lord, a Lord George Germain. He was Secretary of State in America. He doesn't seem to be anything. There's no spark, right? So, Napoleon, Frederick the Great, uh, I think Cornwallis? Is that who I'm thinking of? Yeah, Cornwallis. These people are good at their job. They have something. They bring a little, a little extra something to it. I don't think Lord George Germain brought much. He was there. He was extremely competent, I would say. But he believed every sort of standard idea that was present. The Americans can't fight. They see an army, they'll run. Uh, they have no statesmen. They're hick. They're backwater. We have massive loyalty that will bolster our ranks. This should be a quick and easy fight. One battle will do it. These are the standard ideas that were had. Of course, none of them were true. And he sort of bought into every standard of the day and acted accordingly. So that when things went bad, they sort of like tried to pick him to be the scapegoat. He didn't sort of want to... <laughs> he didn't take it lying down, but there wasn't much he could do. Now, they weren't all... Like I, like I was saying, they weren't all wrong. There was... A strong element of British loyalty in America at the time of the revolution. So, what our George Washington and the like were dealing with at the time was a war against Britain and a civil war at the same time. You see? So, uh, in America, there was a big, like, to do about that. What side are you on? Are you for Pennsylvania or are you for the boy George over there? And it's more vicious than I sort of remember, right? I guess obviously it's from our point of view. We sort of glaze over the bad. But there was one point where loyalists is what they called them, loyal to the crown. They were trying to march in to go help. 400 of these guys. I'm going to go help my king. That's what I think is right. They saw some troops in the distance and thought it was British, so they sort of waited. Wasn't British. They were um, revolutionaries. I forget the guy's name. He was from, I think, Lee? I think he was from Carolina, something like this. In any case, this, ki this guy. Hold on. 
I didn't write his name down. Oh, wait, here it is. Henry Lee, okay? They said he shot him point blank. Like, as soon as he saw him, they're loyalists. F that, shoot them all. I'm like, I don't think most of them were armed, even. He didn't lose any troops. I know that much. A hundred died right then. I think 200 else were, were injured in some way, and the rest got away. But the fact that I'm like, that's a vicious step to straight up, even now it would be sort of vicious to say, I'm just going to kill all these people, right? You take prisoners of war, right? No, he, he, they weren't playing. They really weren't playing. Some, you know, some of the people after the fact did write down, you know, that, that in times that what they did haunted them, right? One, one guy said he shot an officer, a British officer who was, you know, pleading for his life and that he was sort of torn up about it the rest of his life but our Henry Lee was not but Henry Lee was not backwaters this was an educated man with from a from a well-to-do family right it was an example of how wrong they were in Britain about it right so it wasn't from the bottom peasant rising these were the well-to-do of America who committed, you know, and in their minds, why is that important? Because they're bred for it. Winston Churchill was born almost essentially to lead that country, which he ends up doing, right? But they see it as a peasant doesn't have it in him from birth. Some of it they see as bloodline. I think a lot of it's education, right? But in any case, whatever, they believe that from birth, you have this ability to lead. So if I'm fighting peasants and I, you know, I scare them, they'll just leave because they they don't have the mental acumen for it. But if I'm fighting another gentleman, I have to treat him different because he might want to duel me to the death or something like this, right? So the fact that the rich and well-to-do, the gentle, the genteel men of America were the ones leading this fight. I think would have affected the British a little different. But they just never wanted to believe that or to see it. But, you know, this is an example of, you know, these, these cats ain't playing. Uh, ba -ba -ba. We, have a, we have a little bit about Benedict Arnold. Okay, so this was throwing me too. They had a General Clinton. <laughs> so if you say Clinton around me, right, I grew up in that era. I'm thinking Bill Clinton. So the whole time I'm sort of in my mind kind of visualizing Bill Clinton dressed like a British officer, <laughs> which I know is inaccurate. I'll find a picture of the of General Clinton, but I was just it was funny to me listening to this. And he said Clinton. And I thought. I did not lose that war. <laughs> it's a me issue, though. That's I can't put that on the book. It's not a book issue. It's a me issue. <sighs> he was very smart. He liked, which again, you would think is normal, but he liked to read military histories, which wasn't normal. Self-education wasn't normal in officers. You were born rich. You're born smart. You don't, you don't think you need that. He felt he did. And he even didn't like that the histories focused on the battles. He said that's the least important part. He wanted the histories to talk about the supply chain and the politics because he says this is what a general really has to deal with is moving food and boots and bullets and convincing politicians to let you move boots, food, and bullets, right? Because that's the real root of, of a war. And a lot of his ideas get implemented sort of later. Him and Hal, they were very forward-thinking people. Their ideas get implemented, but later on. He, he never got the troops he is asking for. He constantly was asking and never got it. He, like Hal, was aware, because once you get on the ground, you're aware. I'm not going to win a decisive battle. So he's trying to maneuver in a kind of way. I think Hal... Maybe Clinton as well. They they wanted to negotiate. But again, the politicians tied their hands. They were not allowed to negotiate at any point. So I could have seen, I think, in their minds, they could have won. I've won in New York. I win in Pennsylvania. I win in Boston. 
now let me negotiate and we can come to some kind of agreement, right? Because if you hit your guys, then the politics on their side is a little difficult. And if you all offer the olive branch, then they might be a little quicker to take it, right? Like, hey, you know what? Maybe we don't, we don't have to lose everything. He's offering me to keep all my good stuff. Would that have worked? Probably not. Maybe. It actually might have worked. It could have worked. But they didn't have that opportunity. In any case, in amongst this are General Bill Clinton. <laughs> he got the idea of a traitor inside the revolution could swing the whole thing. Uh, I think the guy's named, back in the day, back in Charles II's day, there was a man named George Monk who turned on a rebellion against the king. And it was at a crucial moment, and it turned right that war and reestablished the king, and everything went well. So he's seen as a hero. I guess to, the, his, to his boys, he wouldn't have been seen as much of a hero. But that's the way of a traitor. But from his perspective... That turned that war. So if I could find a high up person. And that's what he tried to do. He wanted he Benedict Arnold's who he found. And he wanted Benedict Arnold to help him take West Point. Now to me this is also fun. When in my mind West Point is obviously a military academy. It's a school right. And yes, it makes officers, but for whatever reason, it doesn't click in my head that these people, that it has a history, that at some point it was militarily important that a battle might have happened there that could have affected the establishment of America. And it's weird to let the two lock in my head. But I think Benedict Arnold was going to help them get West Point. He's going to sort of open the gates. And the, the General Clinton thought this is a major issue. And, of course, it went sideways. Your um, people going to help got caught. It, the beans got spilled. Now, he didn't, He didn't. I think General Clinton, didn't abandon any of these loyalists if he could help. There was one, I forget the guy's name. I didn't write it down. But Benedict Arnold, these other types, he helped reestablish them in Britain somehow after the war. Because you're not going to be well off trying to live in America on the losing side of a revolution. Right, so but he didn't he didn't leave these people to be. Good guy, your general Clinton. Uh we have a we can then come to Cornwallis. I think the best name out of all of them, other than the Lord Sandwich. Lord Sandwich got the best name. I want a sandwich right now. <sighs> okay, when I think when he was young, I want to say fifteen, maybe around there. Fairly young. He wanted... I forget how young he was. He wanted his army group to join Frederick the Great's army and help him fight against... Spain? I forget who he was fighting at the time. But they didn't allow it. They're like, no, we're not going to have that. So he then went on his own, joined Frederick the Great's army, and helped him fight in the Seven Years' War, which kind of blows my mind. In my mind, the events aren't that close together, but apparently they are. It's very cool to me that, you know, this history gets that tight, that close together. He fought, you know, in Frederick the Great's army. He was very smart. He applied himself to his craft, the craft of being a soldier. Studied. Very celebrated, right? Um... Again, he won most of the wars, most of the battles he was in. <clears throat> Except certain ones where he was pushed to go one way instead of another. Right? He he's the one who eventually loses, eventually signs the, you know, the concessions and is out. That's what he's remembered for here. But in Britain, he had a much longer, more illustrious career than that. Of, of all the people who were involved, his star shined the most after. They didn't really hold it against him. They said he fought well. He showed, you know, his ability. He also showed dignity and loss. And so they didn't, the British didn't hold this against him at all. And so 
after the war, you know, years go by, he ends up in charge of a larger army than he ever had in America, in India. They make him the, uh, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of India, the governor of Bengal, which, you know, I'm just now learning about some of that history. I need to get into some of this India history, but that's for a, a different time. I need to find a book. I want a book on every war that's happened in India. That's what I want. Or one that covers a bunch. And then I can get another book on other battles. That's what I want. I want more battles of India. Side note. If you know of any, tell me. In any case, his army fought the, uh, I think it says Tipur Sultan. He was seen by those people in India as very fair, very just. He stopped corruption. He didn't take two paychecks when he could have because he thought it was inappropriate. He paid civil servants higher so that they would be less susceptible to bribes. He was generally liked in India. I think he did a good job. I know the people liked him. So, I mean, if you win the people, you're not that bad of a guy. Now, I suppose some people in India now may look less favorably on the colonial years. But what can you do? Um. Oh, okay. I think this is Lord Sandwich. I think if I wrote this right. He was the head of the Admiralty, which just sounds cool to me. So, he's in charge of all the boats, essentially. And did he not send enough boats to America? No, he did not. But he was also still encouraging exploration at this time. He was the one in charge of, I think, Cook. Captain Cook? He was in charge of sending him out. I think this guy discovered like New Zealand. Maybe Cook didn't, but Hal's initiatives. Not Hal. Lord Sandwich. If I'm right, I think I'm right. I hope I'm right because it's just funny. He helped he helped discover, even I think during the Revolutionary War, New Zealand and Australia, which Australia then became the big Let's send our prisoners there after the revolution. I think they had been sending them to America or wanting to. In any case, they start sending them to Australia after that. He's also the one who helped find, I think, Hawaii. Where I think they end up killing Cook. Our, our Captain Cook gets killed in Hawaii. I didn't know Hawaiians were that vicious. I think he at some point gets a young mistress. A Martha Ray, who, and I'm like, you're reading, I'm reading this book, and then randomly, like, yeah, he gets this mistress who's very, much younger than him. He seems to be happy with her until she's murdered. I'm like, the crap, murder? <laughs> Apparently, after a show one night, when she was watching a, a, a some opera or something, she comes out, and a guy shoots her in the face. I'm like, Jesus, H, Christ, what are you shooting? It was a fan. I'm like, a fan shot her in the face? <laughs> when he gets into detail, he's like, yeah, a fan shot her in the face. His name was Reverend <laughs> James Handman, I think. Hackman. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you can't have Lord Sandwich's mistress get shot by a reverend and me not freak out a little bit. <laughs> uh, what's a reverend doing shooting a lady in the face? He came out of left field. It's history. It actually happened, but it's so wild a moment. In the, in the course of what's happening in this story. It just, I can't, I'm never going to forget this. Apparently he was a former soldier, so maybe he was suffering from PTSDs or something. I just thought it was funny as all get out. It's sad for her, you know, but it's it's been a while. That crap killed me, bro. It killed me. And he sort of, in conclusion, he wraps this all up. The Lord Sandwich murder didn't have much to do with it, other than I think it might have like depressed the man, and then you're less good at your job, right? Because, okay, you're head of the Admiralty, Lord Sandwich. You know, you're Lord North. You're head of Parliament. They weren't like in charge of pe things today. So if you're head of Disney, you don't worry about the soap dispensers at an office 
in New Jersey. You just don't care. That's somebody else's job. Lord North and sort of your admiralty, at that time, the way government worked, you're still fielding questions that are that small, right? So, I have to deal with the budget of the country, where to send an army, how to retake Gibraltar, and Mrs. Newsom's noisy neighbor. Why am I dealing with her noisy neighbor? I have big... Nope, you got to deal with it. That's what we put on the table. So, and it's not its not that it's a big issue, right? If you, I guess if you have an office job or you do something with your brain a lot. It's the, the dedication, you know, I'm doing this thing to stop and then look at that. Even just to look if it's small. Now, if you multiply it, right? So I got a thousand things to look at. It doesn't matter if they're all small. It's, it, refocusing each time take something out of you, right? And so I think that's sort of a problem as well. That's sort of what lent itself to losing this particular war is that, you know, you have unfocused executives. He ends it by saying, you know, that those are the reasons they lost it. The mismanagement of the Navy, the mismanagement of the Army, because the Army was better than us. It just was never fully supplied. That's what sort of lost them the war. But he goes, what you have to remember, again, from the British side, they didn't lose the war so much as retain the empire. Because the, he has a great line. He says, the same men who lost America saved Canada, India, Gibraltar, British Caribbean, right? Guam, I think. At least for a while. So they maintained the empire at a loss of one country that then quickly becomes the biggest trading partner that they have. So in the end, it didn't really hurt them. I think from this, they start to get the idea of a commonwealth as well. And that is sort of, you're leaving autonomy out here, but maintaining loyalty to the big show. And, and it keeps your fingers in a lot of pies. That's what ends up happening, I think. I think it was a big result from ye old Revolutionary War is your... Um, Commonwealth, which lasted up until the World Wars, essentially. But that's a different story. And that's the, uh, that's what I got out of this book. Very fun book, if you're into history. I love the, I love a different angle also on the same history that I sort of learned in school. Very fun. Um, of course, in the book itself, there's a lot more little nuggets here and there. I just covered the big wide swaths, the things I can't help but talk about. Um, ad time? I think I've been long enough jabbering. Ad time? Um, obviously, I want to thank everyone for being here. Like I say every week, these are buckets of fun. I'm glad I haven't had a bad book in a while. I'm trying to avoid them. I don't like wasting my time on a bad book. I got like nine going. Uh, these are obviously my books. You can buy these. The money will go to me. And I'll buy stuff with the money. As people do. Okay, people. Um, I'll talk to you, lovely lot, next week.